All right, we're gonna give it another minute or two for folks to join before we get started. Just another minute, we'll get rolling. All right, good morning, and thank you for joining us. I'm Kenny Fletcher, Communications and Media Relations Director for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Today, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation released a new report titled, Hope on the Half Shell, Harnessing Oysters to Build Ecological and Community Resilience. We're fortunate today to have three expert speakers to discuss this important report. They include Allison Bolden, CBX Maryland Executive Director, Chris Morris, Chris Moore, CBS Virginia Executive Director, and Don Bosch, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, President Emeritus. We'll hear brief remarks from each of our speakers, and then at the end, have time for questions from the press. After I open it up for questions, you can click on the Q&A button that you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and just type, I have a question. When I call on you, we'll unmute you, and then you can ask your question directly. Also, please let us know who you're directing your question to. We'll reserve the chat function for calling out any technical difficulties. So if you have problems hearing anybody or any other technical issues, please put that in chat and then reserve Q&A for questions at the end. Uh, I'll note that this press call is being recorded. Video will be available online afterwards. So now I'm very pleased to turn this over to CBF Maryland Executive Director, Allison Colton. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, Kenny. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for to joining us for today's event. My name is Allison Colden. I'm the Maryland Executive Director for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and it is my pleasure this morning to share with you CBS new report, Hope on the Half Shell, Harnessing Oysters to Build Ecological and Community Resilience. But before I take, kick things off this morning, I would like to stop and take a moment to thank and acknowledge CBS incredible communications team, particularly our senior writer, Cody Yeager, uh, for their contributions and hard work for today's report. Over the years, the Chesapeake Bay has been described as many things, a national treasure, an economic engine, and of course, our nation's largest estuary. But for the nearly 9 million people who live in coastal communities that dot the Bay's shorelines, we know it as so much more. The Bay is woven into the fabric of our everyday lives, from casual conversation over crab feasts to those who make their living working on the water each and every day. Yet these social, cultural, and economic benefits of the Bay are increasingly at risk from the threats of climate change. Increased precipitation, storm intensity, and sea level rise threaten homes and critical infrastructure. Sunny day or nuisance flooding renders our roads impassable, cutting off businesses and emergency services alike. And shoreline properties are eroding at increasing rates, as well as increasing temperatures challenging the electrical grid on our summer's hottest days. These changes are also challenging the Bay's ecosystem and its living resources. More than 250,000 acres of tidal salt marshes are threatened by sea level rise. Warming Bay water places physical stress on species that are already at the end of their tolerance range, species like eelgrass and striped bass. And increased precipitation delivers additional sediment and nutrients into the Bay, fueling algae blooms and blocking sunlight from, sunlight from reaching underwater grasses. The challenges that climate change will bring to the Bay and have already brought to the region are serious and should not be understated. But we're here today to share that there is hope. The Bay's native oyster, which is often touted for its water quality and habitat benefits, is a powerful tool to mitigate and help us adapt to climate change and its challenges. For centuries, oysters buffered shorelines, clarified the water for underwater grasses, increased the productivity of the Bay's fisheries, and provided sustenance to coastal communities. 
However, when these reef habitats and populations were diminished by overharvesting, disease, and pollution, the benefits that oysters provided went with them. Redoubling efforts to recover the bay's oyster population and their reef habitats could not come at a more critical time. Both Maryland and Virginia have embarked on ambitious efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through policies like Maryland's Climate Pollution Reduction Plan. The most recent Chesapeake Bay Program report, also known as the CSER report, reflected on more than 40 years of restoration progress and cites prioritizing restoration co-benefits that benefit both water quality and living resources as a critical next step. And as the 2025 deadline approaches, for the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement, oyster restoration outcomes are one of the few that are likely to be met, making uh, new goals in this arena critical. The Hope on the Half Shell Report takes a deep dive into how Maryland, Virginia, and federal partners can harness the power of oysters and their reef habitats to increase resilience, advance climate mitigation, protect coastal communities and their critical infrastructure, and build equitable economic opportunities through a new blue economy. Next up to walk us through some of the specific policy recommendations of the report is CBF's Virginia Executive Director, Chris Moore. Thanks, Allison. And thanks uh, everyone for uh, joining us today um, as we release this report. Uh, we're really excited about this because as I tell people, you know, oysters are one of the things that binds us throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, <clears throat> whether you like to eat oysters, uh, whether you're someone who's involved in the oyster fishery, whether you're involved in oyster aquaculture, or uh, whether you just like to talk about the benefits, uh, both water quality and also habitat-wise for oysters, um, th they are really a keystone species in the Chesapeake Bay region, and they can help us in so many ways as we, as we move forward, uh, not only in bay restoration, but mitigating climate change, improving water quality, um, and so on. So what I want to do real quickly is talk about what we have identified as six vital outcomes for oysters in the Chesapeake Bay region moving forward. And so I'll start there with one of the things the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has been so focused on for many years now, which is improving water quality. Um, we all know that oysters uh, can improve water quality. Uh, we think of it usually in the, the way they filter, but they also improve water quality through uh, denitrification as well. And the more oysters we get on the water, the more filtering capacity we have, um, the more habitat we have. So continuing to accelerate the pace of our very successful large-scale restoration efforts in Chesapeake Bay uh, will only continue to improve water quality and continue to improve habitat um, here in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, also, as Allison alluded to a little bit earlier, finding ways to facilitate private investment in our oyster um, industry and our oyster restoration industry is going to be really important. And one of the things that has been identified recently, especially through the CSER report and also through a recently released report on uh, the accounting for denitrification of restoration projects and accounting for um, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that oysters assimilate, we can find ways to facilitate private investment in our oyster restoration industry here in the Chesapeake Bay region. Uh, moving on to the next one, um, we really want to see equitable economic opportunities for coastal communities throughout the region. Um, you know, at, at times, some areas have benefited more um, from our oyster resource, and we want to get uh, to a level playing field for all communities who are involved either in fishery, in aquaculture, or for restoration. So continuing to restore and protect those large three-dimensional uh, reef habitats in Chesapeake Bay is going to provide a wealth of opportunity um, from the wild, the wild oysters, the wild set that they provide to increased fishing opportunities for our recreational and our commercial fisheries that happen throughout the Chesapeake Bay. Um, in addition, uh, promoting Chesapeake Bay oyster aquaculture. Um, we have been extremely successful in terms of growing oysters throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, you know, they're, they're coming on and they're developing new names. They're uh, we're hearing uh, about uh, areas, uh, the, the terroir, the, the meroir that their oysters are coming up with. Um, there, there are really real benefits, not only from a water quality and habitat speed, uh, space, but also from the fact that we can grow jobs, um, we can continue to improve water quality with investment in our aquaculture 
um, industry and continuing to market those oysters is going to be really, really important as well. And so we're excited about the opportunities because every time you take oysters to uh, an event, to people, they get excited about learning about Chesapeake Bay oysters. Uh, moving on a little bit more to something that's affecting all of us now, um, uh, in, increases in sea level rise, storm surge, um, oysters really can be a part of the solution to this very complex problem um, here in the Chesapeake Bay region. Uh, increasing the, the use of oysters and oyster habitat in shoreline protection and restoration um, is it, something that I think we all can agree on. And it's something that actually restores a lot of the natural historical functions of oysters along our shoreline. If you go back historically, we have lots of places in Chesapeake Bay, especially in the, the, the southern Chesapeake Bay, where uh, oyster reefs were an integral part of that shoreline habitat and helped protect those shoreline habitats from storm events and um, continuing to do restoration efforts that restore that natural or green infrastructure is going to be really important. Uh, to make that happen, we do need to pursue additional policies to make room for habitat migration um, as sea levels continue to rise uh, in the Chesapeake Bay region. Uh, thinking a little more broadly about climate change mitigation uh, as a whole, um, obviously we want to identify priority areas for restoration um, so that we can we can slow erosion of existing marsh habitats. Um, also, we want to think about opportunities to uh, improve aquaculture siting so it can maximize co-benefits, uh, whether that's <clears throat> storm surge resilience or whether that's the opportunity to take advantage of emerging blue carbon markets um, throughout the uh, U.S. And, and maybe even on a broader scale as well. Um, we can't talk about <clears throat> uh, oysters and, and, and our oyster fishery um, here in the Chesapeake Bay region with thinking about ways that we can continue to modernize our fishery management and ensure sustainable harvest move forward in the region. Uh, one of the things that has been unfortunate about our uh, oyster harvest uh, and our oyster population um, over the last 25 years or so has been somewhat of a boom and bust cycle. Um, as things start to improve, um, unfortunately, we end up in a, in, a, in a downhill situation not too long after that. So we want to make sure that with the scientific tools we have available now, we can manage the oyster population uh, to increase our harvest to levels that actually are uh, sustainable in the future and not be in a situation where uh, we follow good reproduction with um, unsustainable harvest and therefore experience drops in populations. We've all seen um, how exciting the increase in spat sets, the increase in oyster harvest have been in the last couple of years, and we want to make sure that remains on an upward trajectory and, like I say, not somewhat of a boom and bust cycle like we've seen um, over the last 20, 25 years or so. In addition, it's not just about managing oysters. It's also making sure that we manage our very important shell resource um, along, alongside of that. Um, thinking about uh, alternatives uh, is something we should continue to do as well because shell is still a very limited resource here in the Chesapeake Bay region and uh, something that we need to be thinking about as we appropriately and sustainably manage our fishery moving forward. And last, we want to talk about transparency and accountability uh, in fisheries management. Um, again, um, we can only have a, a viable fishery and increasing population if we take steps to, to recenter the science and improve uh, the transparency in our decision making um, throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. Making sure that we restore the confidence that's needed in our fisheries management science and our, our agency management processes will ensure that we have a, a, a much more robust, a much more sustainable fishery moving forward. So I hope you enjoyed some of those top line messages from the report. Um, I want to turn it over to, doc, to Dr. Don Bosch. Uh, Don is one of the nation's most recognized experts on the application of science and politics for restoration, sustainable use of coastal ecosystems. Um, he has served uh, for many years uh, facilitating research here in the Chesapeake Bay region been an advisor to multiple federal agencies and the Chesapeake Bay program. So we feel like there's no one better to talk a little bit about this report. So thank you, Don, for joining us this morning. Thanks, Chris, for that generous introduction. I've been uh, conducting or directing research in the Chesapeake Bay for over 40 years. I've served on a number of oyster roundtables, oyster commissions, and navigated through the turbulent quick fix period where we thought the solution was to bring in another species of oyster into our bay. But the oyster question is much older than my 40-year engagement. 
I'm finishing up a book on the history of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science to, commun to co commemorate its 100th uh, anniversary. Uh, implementing scientifically based recovery and management of native oysters has been an ongoing battle from day one in our organization, and actually even earlier, back into the 19th century. The Chesapeake Bay goal of increasing oyster populations to even 10% of historic levels has remained elusive. Uh, none, nonetheless, the goal of restoring native oyster habitat and populations in 10 tributaries, actually 11, it's turned out, is one of the few material outcomes that was actually achieved, it will be achieved in the 2014 Chesapeake Watershed Agreement uh, by 2025. So we can take, we can celebrate that and, and, and uh, accept that as a success. But this accomplishment should be seen just as the beginning, not the end uh, for recovery of the Bay's oyster population. We must continue in an even smarter way, learning from what we've been able to do, building on what we've learned to take the next steps recommended in this report by CBF in a way that is now also aligned with mitigating and adapting to climate change. While bold, these recommendations are entirely feasible in my opinion, and achieving them would provide manifold benefits for society, ecosystem health, and climate resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bosch, and thank you to all of our speakers. Now we'll open it up to questions from members of the press. Uh, as a reminder, if you have a question, click on the Q&A button there at the bottom of your screen and just type, I have a question into there and I'll call on folks in order that the questions come in. Uh, please also let me know in the Q&A who you're directing your question to or when you ask the question live when we take you off mute. Um, also, when you're off mute, please identify yourself. Uh, and with that, I'll give it a minute for questions to come in. All right, I see one. Um, let's start with Charlie Palm from the Virginia Mercury, and who has a question for Chris Moore. Hey there, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Cool. Um, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I guess I just wanted to ask, um, with this goal being achieved, um, I guess, is there any interest in maybe um, focusing efforts a little bit more on achieving the phosphorus and nitrogen reduction goals, um, you know, kind of focusing efforts there a little bit more. So, Charlie, are, are you talking about bay restoration goals as a whole? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, and, and remember, there's <clears throat> kind of two different drivers here because the uh, Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement obviously had the oyster restoration goal in it, whereas the, the Bay TMDL had the nitrogen and the phosphorus goals in it. So um, you know, CBF remains committed uh, to achieving the nitrogen and the phosphorus goals. Obviously, those are extremely important to water quality um, in Chesapeake Bay and uh, making sure that we have a, a healthy ecosystem moving forward. Uh, I, I think what you see here with a couple things is, one, we want to build on the success um, that we've seen with large-scale restoration that was started by the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement and the uh, the 10 TRIBs that were identified there. Um, also, we now have some new tools in the toolbox um, in terms of meeting those nitrogen and phosphorus goals um, with a nutrient credit program that could be adopted. We already have it adopted for some, for some segments of the oyster aquaculture industry, but we could move forward now um, with some additional opportunities um, when it comes to oyster restoration as well. Um, but, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus, it, it's an all-in game, uh, it's what it amounts to. As you know, you're covering the General Assembly right now, um, everything from um, agriculture operations to wastewater treatment plants to stormwater, um, we need to be investing in all of those resources in, short, in order to ensure we meet the nitrogen and phosphorus goals as well. 
Charlie, did that cover your question? It does. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, let's Can I add something, Chris? I mean, uh, uh, Kenny. Yes, uh, please do. Just to the question, uh, I think these these have to be viewed as hand in hand. The, the 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 water quality goals and the oyster goals, because even achieving the water quality goals, uh, even it, as it affects the oxygen levels, for example, in the deeper waters of the bay, do affect the areas, the habitats that oysters can live in. So we need to do need to do need to continue to pursue those. We've fallen short. We need to close that gap as well as add habitat, that's what the CESA report suggests, in a way that not only provides be uh, benefits to living resources, but also helps clean up uh, the remaining parts of the nutrients that come, excess nutrients into the system uh, that, uh, that come, into the, come into the bay. All right, thank you, Don. Um, with that, let's go to Catherine Caffey, WHRO. Following Catherine, um, we'll cover questions from John Page Williams and Tim Wheeler. Yes, hi. Um, I wanted to ask about what is the status of the um, 10 billion oyster planting goal by 2025? Because last I saw it hit the halfway mark around late 2022. So what's the status of that and how does that effort sort of play into all this? Uh, Allison, do you want to start off with that one? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. For those who aren't familiar, the 10 billion oyster goal that Catherine is referencing um, is related to a group known as the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance, which was founded in 2018, which CBS helps manage and organize. But it is a broad coalition of over 100 partners now, which includes businesses, oyster farmers, nonprofit organizations, and other groups who have been dedicated to adding 10 billion oysters to the Bay by 2025. Um, as of 2024 or late 2023, the latest update is that uh, coalition and the restoration efforts that we've been supporting have planted uh, or added 5.9 billion oysters to the Bay. So we've exceeded that halfway mark and continue to make progress um, every day through policy advocacy and direct action um, in the Chesapeake Bay. The way, that it, um, the way that it corresponds to some of the other recommendations and efforts which are outlined in this report is it's entirely complementary. So the work that the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance does is not only um, direct on the ground action, but supporting funding and policies that will allow us to reach these important oyster restoration goals um, help to support some of the recommendations like increasing the use of oysters and living shorelines to help uh, protect our shoreline communities. And so uh, I would say that the that's the status of the goal and that the that will continue on uh, alongside the recommendations that are included in our report. Catherine, does that cover it for you? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, let's go to John Page Williams, and then after that, I'll um, read a question from Tim Wheeler. Good morning. Thank you all very much for this presentation. I can't wait to read the report. Uh, in regard to uh, using oysters for short to improve shoreline resilience, uh, I know that there's been a, some notable success in Virginia, in places like the Lafayette River and the Nansman River, working with the Nansman tribe to um, have oysters grow in the intertidal zone uh, in, uh, to improve resilience in those areas. But in the lower bay, if I understand correctly, uh, those waters have a natural spatfall that helps to build a resilient oyster community in the intertidal zone. Maryland, because of its lower salinity, uh, colder water temperatures in the winter, um, my impression is that, and lower natural spatfall, uh, that it's been more difficult to do shoreline work involving oysters in Maryland. Is that correct? And uh, if if not, well, if it is, uh, how do we work around that? 
Thank you for the question, John Page. Um, I think you are familiar with some of the very successful living shoreline projects in Maryland, um, including uh, Pines on the Severn. Uh, that being said, we do recognize there are additional challenges with incorporating oysters into living shorelines and coastal resilience projects in Maryland for some of the same um, reasons that John Page outlined. Uh, we tend to have um, blowout tides in Maryland, cold winters, and um, in some places, uh, shoreline adjacent oyster reefs were considered sort of ephemeral due to due to these challenges in Maryland. However, we believe that there are um, some creative ways that we can start to incorporate oysters more so in natural and nature-based infrastructure in Maryland. Um, first is, you know, some of these offshore breakwaters, which do tend to stay either subtidal or uh, just peeking into the inner tidal and utilizing oysters as much as possible in those um, structures provides an opportunity to create oyster habitat while minimizing the risk to those oyster investments. Um, additionally, there is ongoing research about uh, incorporating oysters into existing, uh, what we would call gray infrastructure. So that includes things like riprap revetments. Um, so there may be uh, some additional steps that would need to be taken in Maryland to ensure that these, um, uh, these structures and the infrastructure associated with them are maintained over time. And we recognize there will be areas where incorporating oysters into these shoreline protection structures is not feasible, but maximizing their use as much as possible will help to ensure that those structures are able to adapt and grow with sea level rise over time. Great answer, Allison. Thank you very much. Yeah, I do acknowledge um, the offshore breakwaters in front of CBF's headquarters, the Merrill Center, uh, got planted, I think, in 2005, and they have been tremendous fish habitat. I can speak to that, um, as has the planting on the riprap of the Naval Academy in the mouth of Spa Creek. Uh, both of those have, have uh, certainly been successful. Uh, and all I could say is uh, more power to them. And yes, there certainly are situations further up the Severn River that we can point to. Uh, I hope that this will continue uh, in not just in the Severn, but up and down uh, Maryland's shorelines. Thank you. John Page, Don here. I, I just want to uh, add to what Allison said. I think she covered it pretty well, that it works in some cases and not not, not appropriate in other places. But uh, just to uh, elaborate on the point she raised about uh, if you take gray infrastructure, uh, rocks that are used yes. for shoreline protection, and you can get oysters to establish their recent research by my colleagues at Horn Point have shown that they will survive and continue to grow upward, you know, faster than the rate of sea level rise uh, as they grow. And of course, they they will uh, attract more uh, spat set uh, in those areas. And so it can be under the right circumstances, a self-sustaining solution. All right, Th thank you, Don and Allison for those responses. Uh, I'm gonna read a question from Tim Wheeler. He's, he doesn't have a mic today. Um, his question is, is there a reason to believe current wild harvests are unsustainable? Um, and maybe we can start with Allison and then move on. Sure, thank you for the, for the question, Tim. As you know, in Maryland, we benefit from having um, a very uh, robust oyster stock assessment, um, which uh, gives us both target fishing rates as well as the actual fishing rates for 36, I believe, different NOAA code regions. So Maryland's portion of the bay is, is divided up in this model into these different NOAA code regions. And we're able to evaluate um, on a very geographically specific uh, scale as to whether or not the harvest rates that are occurring in, within those areas are considered sustainable in the long term. The way that that um, stock assessment model is set up is that those target fishing rates are designed to sustain the populations over the long term. Um, sustain them and not necessarily grow them, which means is if you exceed them continuously or chronically, 
um, it will likely result in a reduction of the population. So in Maryland specifically, we are concerned about some very specific regions, Tangier Sound being one of them, St. Mary's River being another, where there have been consecutive years, up to five years of overfishing occurring. And so you'll see in the report that our uh, recommendations related to modernizing fisheries management include concepts like electronic reporting, as well as um, vessel monitoring, which would allow managers to take a more targeted approach to um, oyster harvest management, so that in areas where uh, oyster fishing is not occurring at a level which would be concerning over time, um, those can can continue on while we can while we specifically address uh, regions where it is exceeding those target fishing levels. This is Chris. I'll just add a little bit to that. <clears throat> One of the things that we've been advocating for is a similar. Uh, stock assessment in Virginia because we don't have that and and, and our staff does take um, a, a tremendous amount of data <clears throat> when it comes to setting our season things like that but we don't have the tools that a <clears throat> robust stock assessment would have to do some of those things that Allison talked about in terms of looking more closely at um, specific areas within the bay um, what harvest may look like based upon different spat sets in any given year and things like that so um, we feel like implementing a stock assessment in Virginia would give us another really important tool in the toolbox to making sure we do have sustainable harvest moving forward. You know, we've been blessed the last couple of years with really good spat sets, really good harvest. We know that that's not something that's going to be linear, and we're going to see some changes in that in the future, and we want to be able to respond appropriately. Yeah, just to uh, amend what uh, Chris said, um, uh, the the there are external factors that have to be taken into account, not only the climate, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but also disease pressure, which can wax and wane. So that has to be brought in into the context of the stock assessment uh, moving forward. We have the stock assessment now that's given us a, a, a great new tool that we lacked for you know a century or more uh, to manage this uh, resource in a scientific way, the harvest of this resource in a scientifically robust way. The other thing I would point out is that although we're celebrating, you know, the uptick in harvest in, in Maryland, wild harvest in Maryland, and also this tremendous spat set that we had this year, it's important to recognize that a drought is not success. <laughs> you know, we've had these very dry conditions which increase salinity, which increase the habitat and survival of oysters. Uh, that's not going to last forever. So we need we need to manage the resource to to deal with the low low points. Uh, in their dynamics as well as the high points. And it's right, not often you. that I get uh, Tim Wheeler is speechless, so it's. <laughs> thank you everybody um, for those answers to Tim's question. Let's go to George Nall uh, with WFXR in Roanoke. Um, George, we can take you off mute if you'd like to ask, ask your question live. I, I don't know if y'all can hear me. I, uh, yeah, I'm i kind of on a dicey machine right now. I, I, I'm looking through this, just looking at a broad stroke answer at this. Um, the, uh, the the plan to increase by 20 more streams by 2035 uh, appears to be just aggressive. Uh, how, just broad stroke, how, how, what do you think we need to do to get there? Chris, do you want to start that one off? Yeah, so I, I can only start. So uh, one of the most important things, obviously, is, is picking the right tributaries to work in. And so that that is one of the broad strokes is there. There's been some work that's done, especially with Army Corps in the past, um, that has helped identify um, some tributaries that might be suitable for restoration. Um, also, we obviously need to use the lessons learned um, from the very successful efforts we've had thus far. Uh, to meet the Chesapeake Bay watershed goals so we can take those and move those forward. And then, you know, the last thing is, is identifying the funding and the resources necessary to get those projects on the ground. Um, we obviously <clears throat> have continued, I think, to become more efficient, more cost effective with those type of projects um, over the last five years or so as we've continued to implement those. So um, identifying willing partners, the space to do the projects, and the necessary resources, I think, are the, are the broad strokes things that we need to do. I can follow up a little bit on that. Um, I just like to to point out when we talk about uh, the 20 tributaries that it was the original goal that was proposed by the federal partnership following the executive order 
uh, by pe President Obama in 2009. Um, they originally, you know, supported 20 tributaries and thought that that was an appropriate scale of work for the Chesapeake Bay, given what a large and expansive estuary that we have. So it's sort of bringing that goal back to the surface now that we have learned the tremendous lessons that we have in the 10 tributaries, now 11, that will be completed. Um, whether intentional or not, we have we have produced basically the largest oyster restoration experiment in the world um, and have uh, been fortunate to have monitoring support and funding for monitoring to learn a tremendous amount of information about what has worked well, what has not worked as well, and carrying those lessons forward into 20 additional tributaries. Um, we are so far um, ahead of other estuaries and systems where oyster restoration is occurring that um, it's, we think it's entirely appropriate to continue to build on that success. And the last thing I want to touch on is a couple of times on today's call, we've said 10 tributaries, we've said 11 tributaries, and that's because in Virginia, to steal Chris's thunder, um, there was the addition of, uh, of a sixth tributary, which was driven primarily by tremendous uh, community support and input of uh, the local communities and organizations, including CBF and others, um, who laid a lot of the groundwork for that to become a restoration tributary. And what we have seen for areas that are not included in the 10 tributaries is there has been a tremendous amount of increase in community awareness about the importance of oyster restoration, um, community organizations and nonprofit groups contributing to oyster restoration and growing their efforts around that. So I think that the success of moving into 20 tributaries moving forward is not only continuing to, um, you know, harp on the importance of state and federal cooperation, the incredible amount of federal funding support that has supported this work, but also building upon that tremendous amount of enthusiasm and momentum that has grown within our communities um, to move this goal forward. So I think there's a lot of communities out there living on rivers who are raring to go, ready to be part of that exclusive club. Um, and we think that that's gonna be a critical element to the success of this goal. Let me just add to what uh, the, the criteria that Chris uh, raised, uh, as well as Allison's uh, additional one in terms of community interest and support. Uh, and to think that now that we've done this and shown it can be done at, at some significant scale, uh, the the where we really need to be taken into account. You know, these these were proposed as as enhancing the local habitats. Now I think we need to also take into account enhancing the total population of oysters in the bay, because these uh, sanctuaries can be sources of larvae to go elsewhere, spread elsewhere in the bay, and they also need to be places that can sustain populations even after the initial enhancement. So thinking about this in, in smarter ways that we are looking at, at these restoration sites in a way that there's connectivity among them with the, with the end game of being increasing the total spawning stock of oysters in the Bay is going to be important going forward. All right, thank you everyone for those answers. George, did that cover your question? I'm assuming George is still on mute, um, but we don't have any more questions in the queue. Uh, we do have our, our presenters for a few more minutes. So if you have a question, um, I'll give folks another minute or two to, to type it in the Q&A box. Right, give it just one more minute, please. We'll see no more questions. I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, we should have video and audio of this call. Oh, and I do see John Page raise his hand. So let's go to John Page before we wrap it up. Can we take John Page off mute. Yes, thank you. The uh, Dr. Bosch's concept of conductivity is really intriguing. Uh, how much further would we have to go to achieve that in any areas around? That would be having 
if I understand correctly, having uh, literally uh, oyster communities communicating one, with one another in terms of spat distribution would be just remarkable. How close are we to that in any parts of the Bay? Well, well, John Page, we actually have some tools to help us address that. Uh, Elizabeth North, you, you might know, uh, years ago developed these models that uh, combine an understanding of where the water flows, the bay circulation, the tides, with how the oysters, the oyster larvae behave, whether they go up and down and so on. And, and using that, these models, we can identify which sites are, are the most important for as, as a source of larval dispersal to a broader area, and which sites um, are, 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 should be targets for uh, dispersal into. And so I think we have the technical tools to add on with the data from the monitoring that's been done in these sites, as well as the now overall stock assessment to develop some really robust ways to uh, bring this into, into bear, this connectivity and the larger, larger population of spawners in the bay uh, into reality. Thanks, John Page, for that question. Um, and seeing no more questions have come up since that last call, uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we will have video and audio up on our website. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, you can reach out to me or any of the members of CBF's media team. We're always happy to help. Thanks again. Hope everybody has a good first of the day.